Well, hello, my name is Stephen Gallagher. Uh, I'm a British novelist and uh, screenwriter. I began my career in radio drama, working for the BBC and working for independent stations. And it was there that I kind of learned the basics of the craft and started to, to put together a network of friends who, um, who, with whom I could work and from whom I could get support. And I broke into TV around the same time as I published my first novel. So I've always had the two careers in parallel going along at the same time. So I worked on a show that you may have heard of called Doctor Who. Um, and my, uh, my first doctor was um, Tom Baker and my second doctor was Peter Davison. Um, and around that same time I published my first real novel. I'd done some work before that in novelizations of my radio stories and I'd also novelized the Doctor Who stories. Around the time that I did Doctor Who, um, I also was um, publishing my first novel. Uh, this was 1980, uh, and the book was called Chimera. And it was a fantasy story set in the world of modern science. I was a big fan of Michael Crichton at the time, and his way of blending science and speculation really appealed to me. So I applied that technique to genetic engineering. So Chimera is the story of the first man-chimpanzee hybrid um, to be created in the present day. It's set entirely in the present day, not even in the near future. And that was, that was quite successful for me and it sold to TV uh, and I got to adapt it myself and I learned a lot about screenwriting through that. So I learned basic technique through writing for radio and I learned screen technique by writing Chimera for TV under pressure and um, that launched me on those two parallel careers. So throughout the 90s, um, I continued as a novelist. Um, I had uh, great success with a little novel called Valley of Lights, which I, I wrote at a time when my career wasn't going tremendously well. And I thought I'll write a short story and sell it to somewhere like the man magazine of fantasy and science fiction. Um, and the short story just grew and grew and grew. And in the end, I thought, oh no, this is gonna be a novel. Because the last thing I needed, I had two novels in the trunk already. And the last thing I needed was another novel. What I needed was a quick short story that I could get for some, you know, I could sell for some pretty quick money. Um, so I wrote the novel and I sent it off to my agent. I had a new agent at the time because um, my, my other had, um, had retired from the business and she sent it out and that book gave me a second launch um, and again the uh, the film rights sold straight away and the two novels that I'd written in the meantime that hadn't sold suddenly became more attractive and publishers picked them up as well so I had a really good run throughout the 90s uh, with uh, with those novels and then um, I took a, a kind of a, a break because there was a big change in publishing in Britain um, where publishing had always been editorially led. The editors were the people who chose the projects, the editors were the people who told the marketing people what they wanted to, to publish and the marketing people would respond and deal with that. What happened at the end of the 90s, um, and it was quite kind of curious and significant, is that there was a big switch around um, and the marketing people started telling the editors what to buy. So the, um, the boot was on the other foot, the tail was wagging the dog. And one of the things that really suffered as a result of that was that um, a lot of publishers closed down their horror lines. And for one reason or another, I've told you about Chimera, which was a monster story, a modern monster story. I was often put in the horror bracket. And because I was associated with horror, suddenly I lost my, um, my publisher. In spite of the fact that I wasn't writing horror, I was by that time, I'd, I'd kind of moved into dark crime, um, an area that I tried to make specifically uh, and exclusively my own. Uh, that particular blend of, um, of genres, which I felt was unique to me. And I'd arrived where I wanted to be just at the time when the publishing industry was moving away from, from me. So I finished up doing a lot more TV for quite a while and I always kept a love of prose fiction. So I carried on selling short stories. All the awards I've ever won have been for short stories and short story collections, but I carried on working and I carried on working on prose. And eventually um, there was a project, it was called Victorian Gothic, which um, 
I had wanted to, to work on for ages and every now and again it was a labour of love, I'd go back and I'd, I'd work on it a little bit more and I thought in the end, well, publishing has not gone so well for me but if I don't sit down and write this book I never am going to. And so I wrote down, I sat down, I wrote Victorian Gothic thinking I'll maybe get a small press to pick it up and it'll sell a hundred copies, all signed copies to die-hard collectors and that will be the end of it. It will be out of me and I can move on. So I wrote it and I sent it to another new agent because the previous agent had retired from the business. For some reason I seemed to have a, a knack for driving them out of the industry. And um, the next thing I knew was he called me up to say, I just want you to know how the auction's going on. And I said, what auction? You know, I thought he was just going to take it to this small press who's quite interested in doing it. He says, well, we've got, we've got Bantam on the one hand who, uh, who are bidding for it. And we've got Random House on the other hand who are bidding for it as well. And uh, I think I can actually get the price up if I play them against one another. So I said, well, OK, if you can, by all means do. And um, the end of that story was that I got um, a, a two book contract from uh, Random House to publish Victorian Gothic. Now, the only thing was that my publisher and editor, Shay Earhart, didn't like the title. And I had previously done a TV show called Murder Rooms and my episode was called The Kingdom of Bones and I gave her a list of possible alternate titles which still had The Kingdom of Bones on it and that was the one that she liked so Victorian Gothic became The Kingdom of Bones and of course it was a two book contract that I had so um, there was another one still to be written to follow it up uh, and so The Kingdom of Bones was followed up by The Bedlam Detective now The Kingdom of Bones is the story of what happened to Bram Stoker 10 years before he wrote Dracula. And it's not a vampire story, but it's a dark crime story. And the idea is that what happens to him in the Kingdom of Bones is what he translates as metaphor into his vampire story. So you can kind of see the roots of it all there, but it's the roots in his real life. and. The main character is not Stoker himself, the main character is a bare knuckle boxer named Tom Sayers who is suspected of murder and has to go underground in the fairgrounds and the sideshows of, uh, of Great Britain. And he is pursued by an ex-Pinkerton detective called uh, Sebastian Becker. And Becker is the character who, because Tom Sayers' story is completely told in that book, so Becker is the character who reappears in The Bedlam Detective. And by now, Becker and his family have, uh, have come back to England because they chased Sayers to the USA. Becker and his family have come back to England and he's now working as the, uh, the leg man for the Lord Chancellor's visitor in lunacy. And his job is to investigate the, um, the extremely rich and possibly criminally insane to determine whether they're genuinely insane or not or, um, or if, they, uh, if they're in danger of squandering a fortune or indeed of, his, of relatives misappropriating a fortune. This book um, takes um, an element of some of Conan Doyle's material. Um, it's the story of Professor Owen Lancaster who goes to the, um, the, the southern continent over in South America and um, returns with stories of giant monsters that, uh, that decimated his party. He's one of only two survivors. And the other survivor tells the story, says, no, there was no monsters, the guy went mad. But Owen Lancaster himself is convinced that he was pursued by monsters. And in the present day, young women, uh, two young women, in fact, are, uh, are, are murdered on, uh, on his land. He blames the monsters. And Becker is sent out to see if Owen Lancaster himself has some culpability in this. And what he discovers is something kind of far deeper, more intricate and... Um, this has actually been my most successful book since Nightmare with Angel, which um, is a crime story set in Germany. But, uh, but this is the one that was chosen as uh, one of Kirkus Books' 100 Best Novels of the Year. And um, I was really proud of that one. And of course, what then happened was that uh, my, uh, my editor-publisher at Random House got the push. <laughs> and, and this was a story that I should have been getting used to by now. But I had a two-book contract and by now I was kind of midway through the third novel, picking up on Becker's um, adventures after The Bedlam Detective. 
in this book, The Authentic William James. So this is from a different publisher. This is from the Bruligan Press. Uh, and this is the third Sebastian Becker book. And it's set again amongst the circuses and the sideshows and the early silent movie industry in Britain. And it tells the story of William James, who is a British sideshow cowboy. When Buffalo Bill came to, uh, to Britain at the end of the 19th century, he, um, he did three tours and Vic Queen Victoria was a fan. He was a huge superstar in Britain. He, uh, he set up for several months in Manchester. He toured the country and then he toured the rest of Europe. And when he went back to America, he left behind a legacy of British imitation cowboys who played the circuses, they played the music halls. Some of them pretended they knew Buffalo Bill some of them pretended that um, they'd been in his act and one or two of them actually pretended they were Buffalo Bill. But you had this phenomenon of the British cow sideshow cowboy who had never been to America. William James is a man who, again, is falsely accused of, um, of a murder. So the authentic William James. William James is a British sideshow cowboy who has inherited the act from his father and he's falsely accused of a murder actually several murders, in fact multiple murders, because what he's accused of is burning down a theatre with the audience inside, and he does not deny it. He doesn't deny it, but he doesn't confess to it either. So the mystery of the book is why, why not? Why is he so prepared to take the blame for this? And he escapes from prison, and Becker, who has been sent to um, determine whether he is sane enough to hang, and there's a lot of pressure on Becker to say, yes, he is sane enough to hang because there were some very important people in the audience of the theatre that burned down. So Becker is already involved when he escapes and stays on his trail. Um, and the reason why William James, or one of the reasons why William James is so determined not to speak is because his daughter um, is in the, uh, in the hands of a member of his troop who had more to do with the fire than um, than anybody is prepared to to admit. That guy and his daughter flee back to America and William James, the British sideshow cowboy, must follow them across the old wild west amongst the real cowboys and one of the pleasures for me in writing the book was to put this this figure as a fish out of water in this completely strange environment and to see him thrive and, and, and survive in it and Sebastian Becker once again is hot on his heels and develops a certain sympathy for his quarry so that in the end it's a case of you know do I drag this guilty man back to Britain or do I side with this man whose guilt is by no means clear and um, help him to actually deliver the resolution that he's prepared to sacrifice himself for. So those are the three Sebastian Becker books, The Kingdom of Bones, the Bedlam Detective and the Authentic William James. Whether there will be any more depends on whether my current publisher can survive, whether I can find another one, whether we go on. I mean, there are more stories to tell, that's for sure. But I also have my, uh, my backlist. Uh, you know, I have my backlist of crime and my, um, my TV career continues as well. Um, I'm working on several shows at the moment. Of course, when you, when you work as a writer, um, you're always working and then every now and again you sell something. So the rest of the world sees what you sell and thinks, oh yes, he's come back. Of course, you never go away. You're always, always working. I've been a storyteller all my life. Um, I, can remember the, um, I can remember the very first story that I ever wrote. And I proudly showed it to my parents. And uh, I, I, I think I could barely write at the time. It was a story about a new ghost who goes to school and, um, and all the other ghosts kind of make fun of him until they realize that he's new and then they, they kind of forgive him and make allowances for him. So I was drawing it from my life at the time. And um, all the way through my childhood, I was always fiddling and making something. I made my own movie projector, um, which sounds like a great feat of engineering until you hear that the movie projector consisted of a shoebox with a hole cut in the end of it and a flashlight. And I, I drew the movies on, on plastic bags and held them in front of the, the box and it projected onto the wall and it made a very creditable movie projector. And my first film was uh, a story about my dad and my uncle who, uh, who were building a garage on the, uh, on the concrete at the back of the house. Uh, so that was taken from life as well. And the first time that I ever 
had a notion that I might be able to um, have some kind of uh, a writing career. I'll pause while you come through. Okay. The first time I ever had a notion that I might have some sort of prospect of a writing career was it wasn't in uh, in English lessons it wasn't in anything to do with creative writing it was actually from a geography teacher who after I'd written um, a piece of geography homework handed it in and when I got it back I had a fairly good mark but what he'd written underneath was I like your style and I had never up to that point considered that I might have a style and I became a little bit self-conscious of it after that so my style immediately deteriorated but then over a period of time, you know, I, I began to fall in love with the notion of you know, putting stories together with words and, um, and engaging people with a narrative. And this was when I was about sort of 12, 13. And by the time I was 15, 16, I was seriously trying to write. And I was writing terrible stuff. I have, um, I have a, a file at home, a file box, uh, which is marked Embarrassing Early Projects. And it's got my first unpublished short story in there it's got the um, it's got the rudiments of a musical i tried to write about douglas fairbanks and mary pickford and a bunch of other stuff um, probably i'm pretty sure there must be some adolescent poetry in there and uh, and i think you know the uh, the first thing i'll do when i feel the uh, when i feel the stiffness and the pains coming on is i'll probably burn that so <laughs> so, so so there so there's nothing left to see but when i went to university i did uh, drama and english as, uh, as, uh, as a joint honours subject. And that was fabulous because with English, we got to plunge into Anglo-Saxon and medieval drama and Elizabethan writing and Victorian prose fiction and modern 20th century poetry and prose. And on the drama side of it, we did a lot of theatre history. I wasn't so much into the acting because I very quickly discovered that um, I was not a good actor and shouldn't try. I'd been fine in the school play, which had got me into the into the idea of going to drama school, but as soon as I was in the company of people who could genuinely do it, I realized that my talents were gonna lie elsewhere. So at that time, I, um, I started trying to write seriously, and I, um, I, I wrote um, a short story for a competition in a magazine called Science Fiction Monthly, which I sent off and which got absolutely nowhere. I did the TV director's course in the drama department and wrote a TV play for that, a short 15 minute thing, which was the first thing I'd ever actually written that I'd finished and was then able to go on and perform and, um, or see performed. And that was a kind of inspiration as well because every time you finish something, especially early in your career, you feel it's, it's like a, a notch on a wheel. You know, you get that little bit further and there's no going back from it. And I always encourage everyone, you know, you're not an aspiring writer, you're an ambitious writer. You know, never, never describe yourself as an aspiring writer. Stop aspiring, just be ambitious. Um, and so I came out of university, again, unpublished, with just this one little 15 minute play to my name, um, and went to work at a TV company. And I worked there for five years in the presentation department, which was not a creative job, but it did involve working with a lot of creative people. And those creative people, as I did, all got a little frustrated in not being able to express their own creativity. There were, there were actors, there were technicians, there were uh, producers, all of whom were, were producing commercials and trails and um, publicity, and nobody was doing drama. But we all wanted to do drama. So I forget exactly who it was who suggested it. I think it might have been a friend of mine called Chris Kay, who said, let's all get together and let's do something. I'd already had a, a go at writing a stage play for one of the other people, a guy called Charles Foster, who had a little theatre company. So I wrote a musical for him, which I hope will never see the light of day again. Um, but again, it was a notch on the wheel. We got one step further. It was one more little achievement to say, well, you know, we're further down the path. And this was when I got my start in radio. So the first thing that we all did together was a radio drama, which we did as a kind of little communal effort. Um, the producer from the radio station up the road 
got us access to the facilities up there so we had the studios and the uh, the tape machines and everything there all the actors who work for the tv company doing continuity announcement you know we're sorry for the loss of your programs we'll be getting them back as soon as we possibly can in the meantime here's some music that's all they ever got to say all day now they got to actually play some real meaty parts and i wrote a half hour first episode of a dramatic radio serial and the program controller of the local radio station says yes okay let's do this i'll give you a budget so then i was tasked with writing another five half hours in order to bring the thing up to length and i have um i've written better and i've written more but i've never learned as much as i learned in the few weeks that it took me to get those scripts out and then put them in the hands of friends and then see it put onto its feet as, um, as a, a working production. And from there I went to um, the BBC and pitched them radio plays. And it was at a time when the BBC was very, very active in radio drama. And they had a slot called Saturday Night Theatre, which was 90 minutes long. And they specialised in thrillers and mysteries. And I sold a couple of those and then I sold a science fiction play into the same slot. And because it was an hour and a half, it was like writing a movie. And because it was radio, you had all the resources you could possibly ask for. You know, if you wanted a jumbo jet crashing out of the sky, which I had in my very first one, you could have it. There was no, you know, no impediment, no cost. And um, so I learned a tremendous amount there as well. And it was while I was working on this radio material that the producer I was working with, Martin Jenkins, sent my science fiction script over to the Doctor Who production office. And the Doctor Who production office, the, um, the script editor there, Christopher Bidmead, gave me a call and said, come over and talk to us. And as a result of that, that's how I finished up getting my break into television and that's how I finished up working on Doctor Who. And it was from there on, in tandem with the, um, the novels that I'd begun to develop up to full length and, and publish, that um, really the rest of my career unspooled. There was no great plan to it. If I had a plan, certainly it didn't work out the way that I planned it. But as I always say, you've got to have a plan, throw yourself in the general direction of what you want to do, and then kind of work it out as you go. Because, um, you know, as they say, you know, no, no plan ever uh, survives the first exchange of gunfire. <laughs> The way I work, um, I'm not a hugely organised writer in my own mind, although to some other people it does seem that I am. The technique that I developed in radio has served me very well, um, and I will still do an early draft in which I will lay out the plot, and then I will add the dialogue separately, and then I will add research into the um, into the document that I then have and only finally when I know exactly what everything is will I sit down and write the final thing and then I will keep a daily tally and I will I will hack it then almost you know I, I will it's, it's like a route march but up to that point it's kind of nebulous and it's kind of organized and I do reckon that the starting point of any project I have plenty of ideas but it's rare to find an idea where I feel yeah, there's, there's a book in this, there's a TV show in this, there is a big story in this. And what usually happens is that I've got an idea lying around that kind of feels good, but doesn't feel as if it's going anywhere. But when I put that together with a different idea, the two kind of spark off each other. And from that point onwards, you start seeing endless possibilities. And you go from thinking, I really don't see where to go with this, to a point of, I cannot wait to get down and, and carry on working with this because the ideas are coming thick and fast. The ideas generate more ideas. So in terms of you know, my working method, you know, there, there is the working up of the ideas and then there is the laying out of the, um, of the notions and the different parts of those ideas, see which relate to each other see which falls into a story. You start to see the shape of the story. You start to see the early development, what kicks it off. And if you haven't got anything that kicks it off, then there is a gap there that needs filling and then your imagination starts to work on the gap. And then there is your central area. It's almost like a three act structure where the central area is the complication. But then you need to know what your big finale is going to be. 
where is it all going to go what's the point you're all going to make at the end of it and you move your material around and you kind of get that right and I do reckon that I can um, I, I have those yellow legal pads that they always talk about in America I, I brought a bunch of them back with me when I worked over there and uh, and I continue to use them and I do reckon that I can get the essence of an idea on one sheet of paper in tiny tiny writing and I always keep that by me and I can glance at it and I know where I am in the story and I know where the story's going and I'm only working on one part of the story at any given time I may be working on the structure I may be working on the dialogue I may be working on the research and all the way through I'm telling myself the um, this is not the hard part the hard part is going to be the next part when I have to put all this together so for the moment relax enjoy it play with it you know don't feel too stressed about it don't worry too much about getting it perfect and then halfway through i deliberately consciously say to myself the hard part is now done the easy part is now where all i have to do is just coast to the end because i've done all the labor and um I know it's I, I know it's a trick you know it's a trick that I play on myself and it works every time so all the way through right up to the midpoint I'm relaxed and right up to the end point I'm relaxed and at the end of it because I work in layers rather than a rough first draft and then rewrite it my prose draft when I get to the end of the layers is usually 90% of the way there if not more there's usually not a lot needs doing to it afterwards it doesn't need a huge polish it might need a little bit of rearrangement when I look and I see well the structure that I imagined was going to work is going to work but um, but no that's my working method and if you can take anything from that and make use of it then you're welcome to and, um, and good luck with it <laughs>